All right, uh, my name is Sage Weil. I've been working on Ceph for a very long time. Um, today I'm going to talk about what's coming in the next release, Octopus, which is due out in March. Um, so we switched this cycle around to um, a 12 month release cycle. So the plan is to do release, a major release every 12 months, um, every March, basically. So we have sort of a predictable cadence, and every release gets sort of the full attention it deserves. So Octopus is next, um, and it's coming soon. Um, so in front of the Nautilus release, we, um, we decided that we had four priorities, um, but it turns out that when you think of priorities and you have too many of them, they aren't really priorities anymore. Um, so we sort of changed our thinking a little bit um, in terms of, for Octopus, and just sort of grouped um, our efforts into five sort of important themes that we want to be um, paying attention to in all cases. Um, the addition really is quality, because that's in many ways the most important thing, and it wasn't on our list. So. Um, these are sort of the five themes that I'll be talking about, and I'm going to start with usability. Um, so Mike mentioned the orchestrator API. Um, this is, um, I think, one of the most exciting things that's um, going to be an octopus. Um, again, it's um, essentially creating an abstraction that allows Ceph to call out to whatever deployment tool was provisioning it. Um, our focus is going to be on two implementations, um, Rook for cases where Ceph is deployed inside of Kubernetes, so um, the Ceph dashboard or your CLI can go tell Rook to create an OSD or whatever. Um, and the SSH orchestrator, which is going to be sort of a bare bones, trivial um, orchestrator um, that's going to be sort of the moral successor to Ceph deploy. Um, so this is allowing you to do things like create new daemons, expand to new nodes, remove daemons to contract a cluster, that sort of thing. Um, and eventually with the goal of replacing the Ceph deploy tool that um, has been sort of neglected in recent years. Um, and the idea also then is that when you create a new cluster, you would have sort of a bootstrap process that would just create one monitor and one manager on the local node. And then in order to build the rest of the cluster, you'd use the orchestrator API to sort of add everything additionally, everything being coming a, a day two operation. Um, this will pave the way for streamlining all the documentation um, about installation steps on, on docs.ceph.com, which is sort of has random references to Ceph deploy or just doesn't really tell you exactly what to do. So our documentation can be consistent regardless of whether you sort of started in Kubernetes or didn't. Um, and hopefully then the step after this will be the ability to automate upgrades. So that sort of the weird sequence of upgrade steps and random stuff that you have to do to upgrade a sub cluster from one, one major release to the next can be actually done automatically um, by the manager daemon. So we're very excited about that. Um, the dashboard is sort of one of the biggest steps forward in usability in Ceph in a long time. So lots of effort continuing there. Um, sort of the big milestone for Octopus will be integrating with this manager API or with this, yeah, manager API, orchestrator API so that um, through the GUI, you can go add OSDs, replace disks, um, that sort of thing. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff, though. Um, I checked with Lens before this talk just to find out what was going on, because I don't usually follow the dashboard that closely. But it's there's sidebars bar for notifications about cluster events, um, progress um, status, and so on. Um, a bunch of stuff on CephFS for managing snapshots, just to sort of complete the experience. Um, they're adding um, a bunch of stuff for RGW multi-site management and viewing the status and state of the system. And some stuff with passwords to make sure that you can you can hand give some like a new user an account and when they log in they have to change their password the first time they log in that sort of stuff. Um, and then a bunch of miscellaneous stuff um, sort of falling into this bucket um, on the on the Rados front. Uh, so um, there we had an intern over the summer who worked on the progress events. So when you do Ceph S now you might have noticed starting in Nautilus that occasionally you get sort of a progress bar on like um, migrating data after you mark an OSD out that sort of thing. Um, we've improved those current events and been adding new events for other sort of major events that happen in the system, so you can sort of see um, Ceph doing work in the background. Um, we've added health alert muting, um, so you can either mute in a health alert for some limited period of time. It'll sort of unmute if it goes away. Um, it won't if it gets worse, um, so it's pretty clever about making sure that, that, that those things behave the way you'd want them to. Um, there's ongoing efforts just to make everything just hands off by default. So starting in Octopus, the PG Autoscaler is going to be on by default. The balancer is going to be on by default. You can turn them all off, of course, if you don't want to. And when you upgrade, they won't necessarily turn themselves on. But for new clusters, we want sort of a more um, complete, simple experience out of the box. And some stuff on the back end, the Ceph tell and Ceph daemon commands, which sort of allow you to do behind the scenes um, communicating with daemons. That's all been cleaned up, so it's the same command set for both, and they sort of uniformly work in a more consistent way, um, and so on. Um, on the quality front. 
a lot of effort, um, as always, is just going into Rados robustness. So Neha, the, um, the Rados um, lead developer, did a great talk about this at Cephalocon that I encourage you to go check out um, if you haven't already. Um, and her basic point was that um, there aren't really, really big, exciting things that we do to just make Rados better. It's really just the cumulative sum of lots of little improvements and fixes um, that overall increase the overall robustness and stability of the system. And that theme continues in Octopus. Um, so partial object recovery is a big one that we've been talking about for a long time and haven't done, so that if you have you know, one replica down for a brief period of time and you update one byte in the object and it comes back up, it'll really just copy that one byte to bring them back in sync instead of copying the whole four megs or whatever the object is. Um, so that's there. Um, we've improved the prioritization and scheduling of which PGs recover when. Um, well, we haven't actually yet, but this is planned. We're going to um, for Octopus. Um, we have fixed the snapshot trimming. Um, it turns out there is a bunch of metadata in the OSD map about what snapshots have been deleted over all of history. Um, and it's been growing for, what, 10 years or whatever now. And I've actually never received a user complaint about it, but it's sort of been um, keeping me up at night. So that's fixed in Octopus um, with a much sort of simpler approach um, and much cleaner. And then there's this other nagging thing called the read hole that's also been keeping me up. Um, that we know about for a long time, there's a very obscure corner condition where you can have a fenced off OSD and client that aren't noticing what the rest of the cluster is doing that could serve a stale read. Um, and that's getting fixed, finally. So I'll sleep a little bit better. Um, the other sort of most exciting thing actually um, in, this, in this category is um, the telemetry and crash reports. Um, so starting in Nautilus, actually Mimic, we have a telemetry feature where you can Flip us, you can opt in and your cluster will phone home with some basic information about the cluster, how big it is, what version you're running, um, and so on. So um, we've been doing continual improvements to that. Um, we've improved the opt-in mechanism, so um, there's a, a revision of what data is included. So if you opt in today and then later we add some additional information, it will stop reporting and you'll have to opt in again to make sure that you approve with what information is being shared. We're being very, very careful about what we include in that report so that it's non-identifying non and hopefully everybody can turn it on without sort of losing any sleep. Um, but if we were very interested in feedback about this, if you haven't turned on telemetry now, go look at it <laughs> and decide if there's any reason why you wouldn't. And if there is, tell us because we really want to know. Um, We've also separated out the sort of the categories of information that it reports into separate categories that you can individually turn on and off. Um, so um, there's basic information about what version you're running and how big your cluster is. Um, that's just interesting for us. Um, you can optionally identify yourself, and so we can know that this particular cluster that's phoning in is, is you. That's off by default, of course, but you can, if you want to tell us, you can. Um, and we've added um, crash metadata. So now all the Ceph demons when they crash um, generate sort of some um, basic metadata about what daemon it was, what the stack trace looked like, what version it was. Again, not identifying, but this all gets phoned home also so that we can find out when we push out a new release if a lot of people are experiencing, or even one person is experiencing a particular crash. And so we can find out if a bug um, has been introduced, if it's been fixed, what versions it's affecting, how frequently it's happening, all that good stuff. Um, so this is very important for the developers to help improve the quality of the system. Um, and then we're also looking at the back end to improve tools to actually process this data and find out you know, what those crashes are, generate a signature from crash dumps that we can sort of track across different versions to find out um, what things have been fixed and so on. So um, we're, we're excited about that. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is that um, Ceph is now collecting smart data for all the devices and storing it in the cluster. Um, we haven't yet added this, but plan to make the telemetry phone that home as well so we can build sort of a public data set of generic um, failure data for hard drives and for SSDs so that we can then use that to train a better prediction model um, so you can find out when your devices are going to fail. Um, so there's a group of data scientists who are working on that right now. And they're trying to build a better, a w better way of building the model so that it's instead of predicting whether the device is good or bad, which is sort of a subjective determination, um, instead predicting what the error rate for the device is going to be. So it's sort of a, I guess it's a regression instead of a categorization, whatever it is. Um, but we're, we're doing that. And they're also looking at some vendor-specific data from a drive manufacturer to find out if it's useful. And if so, they're going to go add that to Smart Cuddle so that everybody can collect that data as well. Um, but we're excited about that progress. Um, the CIN test, um, we're generating container images now for all of our test builds um, for the purposes of testing with Rook and other tools. Um, we're also generating container images for releases, of course, too. 
Um, and there's a sort of a whole set of meetings across the different components within um, the Ceph project to meet and review what the QA suite is covering and ways that we can improve it. So there's sort of a across the board effort to re-review and improve the overall testing coverage for Ceph. Um, we'd like to, um, uh, we're resurrecting the effort to make sure that we have good testing of different client versions and different servers. Um, there is a test suite, but it's not really complete, but making sure that, you know, Hammer clients can still talk to Nautilus and Nautilus clients can still talk to Hammer and, and so on. Um, and also what we'd, we'd like to do for Octopus is finally have a downgrade test suite so that for within point releases at least, as a point release comes out, we verify that you can upgrade to the latest point release and then downgrade to a previous one in case there's some problem that gets introduced. Um, this is normally safe, but it's not tested. And, you know, if you don't really test it, you don't really know. <laughs> if it's safe, but it's supposed to work. So we want to make sure we actually test it and we know, we know that it does work. Um, performance um, is always a big um, challenge for users and a big focus for, for a lot of us. Um, so on the blue storefront, a lot of stuff's going on in the RocksDB safe um, space. So upstream RocksDB has finally had its support for a stable deletion of range, a range of keys. Um, this has been sort of in a prototype state in RocksDB for years and they finally sort of fixed all the issues and it's supportable, so we're using that. Um, there's a bunch of fixes in prefetching that improve performance for enumerating objects and enumerating OMAP keys and compaction and a couple other places where BlueStore would slow to a crawl for inexplicably. Um, it turns out prefetching just fixed a lot of that stuff. Um, there's also a, a big effort right now to, um, uh, to shard um, our data across lots of different column families within RocksDB. Um, this makes the compaction, background compaction work a lot better. Um, it improves our space utilization, improves overall performance, a bunch of stuff for sort of weird implementation reasons within RocksDB, this helps a lot. Um, so we're gonna do that. Um, the, our management of memory and how we're consuming it for caches has been improved significantly. Um, and we're also um, improving the, the per pool statistics gathering. So in, in Nautilus, um, we track uh, space utilization for object data across different pools. And so you can see like your compression ratios by pool. Um, but we forgot to do OMAP, so in Octopus, um, it does OMAP also, so you can see how much actual disk space is consumed by OMAP data um, by pool. Um, QoS also has been something that we've been talking about for I think like three years now, um, maybe two years, um, but has, hasn't made a lot of progress. So Sam Just, who is the former Rados lead, um, is focusing on this, um, or one of the two things he's focusing on. We're making a lot of progress. It turns out there's sort of a couple tricky issues about uh, managing the queue depth of the work that's being submitted to Rados. Um, so we've made progress in figuring out um, how to sort of d decide quasi-manually how deep that cube should be for a given hardware configuration. Um, we we're hoping to sort of have Ceph automatically tune itself and have some feedback mechanism to do it. We haven't really ha hit that goalie, holy grail yet, um, but at least we're gonna have sort of a repeatable automated, hopefully, process so it'll like, the OSD will calibrate itself with a particular hardware and then, and then manage the queue appropriately. Um, so that's, progress there, and then we're sort of pivoting to um, rebasing all of the DM clock algorithm patches on top of the latest code um, so that we can do some proper evaluation and see how well this works. Um, and hopefully, you know, knock on wood, if things go well, we'll have some basic implementation of this in Octopus. Um, but even if we don't, we've made significant progress and are actually moving forward here, so, so I'm, I'm very optimistic on that front. Um, in the CephFS team, um, they're working on some asynchronous support for doing crates and unlinks. Um, CephFS, the CephFS client server protocol is highly stateful, lots of locks and leases, but one of the, um, one of the cases where it sort of um, was a little bit weak was that um, either crates and unlinks were always a synchronous request to the metadata server. Um, it didn't have to do any I.O., but there was still a request that goes over the wire. Um, so this is sort of extending our locking and leasing mechanism to allow those crates and unlinks to be asynchronous. So things like um, removing lots of files or untarring lots of files should go much faster. Um, it's tricky and hairy, um, but they're, they're, they're working on it and it's um, making progress. So excited about that. Um, and then on the RGW performance front, um, lots of stuff going on there too. There are, I mean, this is sort of a continual battle. There are a bunch of things that improved in Nautilus with the new Beast front end and so on. For Octopus, um, there are improvements for auto sharding, um, sort of automatically as buckets get really big, the indexes have to split into different pieces. Um, improvements there. Um, lots of stuff around the OMAP usage. It turns out that RGW was using um, OMAP, which is sort of Rados objects storing key value data. 
using those type of objects in places where it didn't really need to. Um, it didn't need sort of ordered keys. It just was really needed a queue. Um, and so a lot of that work is just being shifted away from OMAP. Um, and then other places where we are using OMAP isn't using things like delete range just so it's more, more efficient. So um, improvements there. Um, but the biggest thing happening on the performance front, front is Project Crimson. Um, so it turns out that um, you can sort of make um, stuff OSDs back to S by SSDs. You can make these clusters go arbitrarily fast by scaling out um, or just like throwing more CPU at it. Um, but our performance limitation was really not so much the, how fast the storage was anymore, it was um, how much CPU you needed to allocate to run the OSDs in order to like keep the storage busy. Um, and a lot of this is just an artifact of the Ceph code being sort of based on the traditional multi-threaded model where you have lots of execution threads and mutexes and work queues and so on. Um, it turns out that that model of doing storage I.O. just doesn't really work very well for solid state devices that are as, almost as fast as memory. So Crimson is sort of completely reimagining this. Um, it's using a programming framework called CSTAR um, that's all based on sort of run to completion and asynchronous futures. Um, you basically have a single execution thread per core and you statically pin them to an actual physical core and they just run full bore and they do all their coordination by lockless queues. Um, but you sort of explicitly take your data and your work and you sort of allocate it to these different cores so they can go really fast without ever waiting. Um, and so Crimson is doing that. Um, they're making good progress. They're, the current milestone is basically to get the whole stack working so that you can have an RBD um, image doing a performance test going all the way across the wire to an OSD and so on. So they're, they have, they basically have almost, I think, I, they're, they're super close to actually being able to do that if they haven't already. Um, and that'll sort of validate a lot of our design assumptions and assuming things go well. The next big step is to sort of design a new OSD backend that's targeting specifically hardware that we expect in the next one to two years. And that's gonna be um, probably a combination of persistent memory, um, something like 3D cross point, cross point or battery backed ins or something like that. Um, and um, these new SSDs that are, have a zoned based interface, they're kind of like SMR drive type interface, but for SSDs, that shifts a lot of the work of doing garbage collection and load balancing and stuff. I'm not loaded, that is where we're leveling into user space and makes the SSDs uh, much cheaper. So these, these new SSDs are gonna be like tens of terabytes. Um, so we'll be able to effectively use those as well. Um, so we're very excited about that. Um, last two, uh, multi-site. Um, so a lot of work has gone into making Ceph um, have features that can let it allow it to replicate and talk across multiple Ceph clusters in different data centers. Um, so a couple things going on there. On the CephFS front, we haven't really done anything, um, any multi-site features um, yet. Um, but for Octopus, we are working on a couple of things. The first is just um, infrastructure for just scheduling snapshots. Um, so you can say I want daily, weekly, monthly snapshots on this particular directory and this one and so on. Um, so that in addition to that, you can have sort of automatic periodic um, syncing of data across clusters based on that snapshot schedule. Um, so you could have you know, this particular directory mirrored every 10 minutes to this remote cluster, for example, and if you lose the first one, you can fail over on the other one and, and so on. Um, so that's a goal. Um, working on that for Octopus. We're also talking about sort of more sophisticated multi-site, um, you know, maybe loosely consistent bi-directional replication for a file system, but these are pretty hairy topics, and so right now we're just sort of trying to figure out what's feasible and what would make sense. Um, but for Octopus, um, the snapshot schedule-based replication is what we're looking at. On the RBD front, uh, mirroring, also some things going on here. So today, RBD already has this mirroring feature um, that allows you to mirror individual, individual images or entire pools across clusters. Um, it basically is just replicating the entire write stream to the remote cluster, and if you lose the, um, the primary image, then you can fail over to the backup, and it'll, you'll lose you know, seconds or however, whatever the delay was in that replication. Um, but it's a point in time consistent copy. Um, so uh, a couple things we've done. The, the setup procedure is getting vastly simplified. The current instructions for setting this up are pretty tedious and complicated. Um, we're trying to reduce it down to like two commands. You run something on cluster one, copy a string, and then paste it into cluster two, and then it sort of sets itself up. Um, so that'll be nice. Um, and we're also making it so that you can use um, RBD NBD in, in, a, in a more scalable way. Currently, um, if you're using the NBD mode for RBD, which is sort of the, the kernel user space pass-through, um, there's sort of one daemon and client per image that you map. 
Um, whereas the kernel client, you could have like a thousand RVD images and it's all sort of the same in kernel client kind of talking to the cluster. So we're trying to do the same thing for MBD so that there's a single daemon that's talking to the cluster and serving all the I.O. for lots and lots of mapped RV images. Um, that's important for scaling in cases like Kubernetes where you might have lots of containers talking to the cluster um, and you want to use these sort of advanced feature sets. Um, so working on that. Um, but the new thing for multi-cluster is sort of a snapshot based mode which will work basically like what I just described for SFFS. So there'll just be RBD snapshots created on a regular schedule and those will get those snapshots will get synchronized to the remote cluster. And for RBD mirroring, it'll use the same daemon. It'll basically just be like a command where you set the mode, where it'll either use the, the current thing where it's like journaling and so on, or to use the snapshot mirroring. And the nice thing about the mirroring mode is it'll be, it'll be lighter weight, um, and it'll also work with the kernel client. Um, so you can continue to use the same deployment modes and so on. Uh, and the last thing, um, ecosystem, community, integrations, and so on. A couple interesting things going on there. Um, the whole Kubernetes space is big, obviously, so lots of stuff happening there. A lot of work has been going into Ceph CSI, um, CSI being the new abstraction for how Kubernetes talks to storage systems. Um, so existing support for RWO and RWX and RBD and so on. Um, that's getting flushed out to make sure that all the odds and ends, like snapshots and clones and so on, are all supported. Um, and then in the Rook space, um, Rook 1.1 was just released, I think last week, last Friday, Thursday, or something like that. Um, and it has a, a number of nice things. Um, by default now, it um, handles all the Ceph CSI for you. So all the old Flux driver stuff is all gone, or at least not used by default. Um, it'll basically set up the Ceph CSI instances in the cluster automatically and magically and make sure it's all configured and attached to the cluster. So it's sort of a turnkey simplified experience. Um, also, it has dynamic bucket provisioning, which is um, taking sort of the model that you have for persistent volumes where you have a claim saying, I want storage, and then the back end goes and provisions it and connects it, giving you the same experience with um, S3 compatible buckets. So you can say, I want a bucket using the storage class, and RGW will go provision a bucket and give you a credential and pass it into your container. So you have this sort of end-to-end -end seamless experience. Um, but it's, it's a generic, um, abstract interface, so you could have another storage class that's S3 and it'll give you an S3 bucket, or you can have one that's some other object storage system and it'll do the same thing. Um, so that's there. Um, there's also an external cluster mode so that um, you can use sort of the, I don't know if it's the bottom half or the top half. Rook sort of does two things. It manages your SEP cluster for you and it also defines all these CRDs that let you sort of um, interact with your storage in a generic way. Um, you know, I want an RBD pool that has images and I want a file system that does this. Um, and so this external cluster mode lets you get all the CRDs so you have the same way of requesting and consuming storage, um, but it just points at an existing SEP cluster that you provisioned with something else, whether it's Ansible or SEPDeploy or whatever it is, or even a different Rook cluster somewhere else. Um, so that external mode is added too. Um, upgrades are improved, configuration is simplified, lots of stuff. I'm looking forward to Octopus. Um, the first priority is around um, exposing these RBD mirroring capabilities through Rook and Kubernetes um, to giving you sort of that end-to-end -end experience. Um, we're also want to at least map out how we're going to do the RGW multi-site stuff through Kubernetes. I'm not sure if we're going to actually get it done in time, but that's the, we're working on it. And then mirroring is for the file system is going to come uh, later. And then the last thing I'll mention sort of on the community front is around um, Samba and ZFS. There's a lot of work going on to just make that whole integration work better. Um, with Nautilus, there's a lot of work on the NFS side. Um, the Samba stuff is getting, getting cleaned up as well. And then um, for this last section, I wanna sort of switch topics and give you a preview of what we're doing for um, what the Rados Gateway roadmap looks like. So when I was talking about multi-site, I talked about RBD and ZFS. I sort of skipped over RGW, but this is actually sort of the, the most interesting, I think, and most um, exciting set of features that we're planning. Um, so just sort of a, a, a crash course refresher on what RGW looks like today. Um, you have lots of Rados gateway daemons um, that are sort of the front end that are speaking S3 out the front. On the back end, they talk to Rados and store those S3 objects in a SAF cluster. Um, and that consists of a pool, a Rados pool that has all the sort of the metadata about the users and buckets. Um, so that's sort of um, the namespace, what buckets exist, what users, what their credentials are, that sort of thing. There's another pool that has all the bucket indexes, which are sort of the S3 object names um, inside the bucket and 
um, to do like object listings and such. And then of course there are one or more data pools that actually store all the S3, S3 data. And collectively, sort of this group of all these things, the set of Rados pools and the gateways is called a zone. It's sort of the, the unit of deployment of um, Rados gateway instances or whatever. Um, but you can have multiple zones. Um, so since I think it's like Joule or something, we've had um, a federation capability. Um, so you can imagine two different Ceph clusters um, signified by the colors. Um, each cluster would have two different RGW zones, but they could belong to the same federated namespace, or realm is, is the sort of the term that RGW uses. Uh, and the basic idea here, um, in the simplest case, um, you're just federating them, so they're sort of replicating the, the user in bucket. They share what's, what buckets exist, but each individual bucket um, sort of actually lives in one particular zone. So foo might be in zone A1, and bar might be in B1. If you hit the wrong gateway, it'll do a redirect and send you to the right one. This, is, this sort of picture is roughly what you get from actual AWS S3, where they have regions all over the world, a global namespace. If you go to any data center, it'll sort of bounce you to the right one or do some DNS magic, whatever it is, uh, to get you to the right place. But it, this gives you sort of the, the federated ability to take lots of stuff clusters, stitch them together into one namespace. Um, but the federation current support also lets you do geo-replication. So you can take, currently you can have you know, another cluster, and on a zone-by-zone -zone basis, you can sort of group those zones together um, and make them replicate not just the metadata for the namespace, but also the actual bucket contents. So in this case, we have zones C1 and C2, um, and they're actually replicating the, the data. And presumably, you'd put those in different clusters in different regions of the world or whatever it is so that you get some, some um, fault tolerance. Um, so the motivation here is that, uh, is again scale. So obviously you can scale nodes up and make things go faster, bigger disks and so on. You can scale individual Ceph clusters out, um, but that's not really good enough because organizations are also scaling sort of um, globally. You have multiple sites and data centers, um, multiple business units or groups within an organization have different needs and so on. Um, and also you have um, organizations that are, aren't just using on-premises data centers, but they're also consuming the public cloud. And at the end of the day, they want all of their data to be accessible from everywhere and be able to move it around and do all this stuff. Um, and so sort of the, at a high level, the things that people need are sort of this universal global connectivity. You can always get to your data. Um, you want API consistency. So regardless of whether you're deploying your stuff in on-premises or in Amazon or in Azure or in Google Cloud or somewhere else, you don't want to have different object APIs to think about. You want to just code everything to one API so the same thing can be deployed anywhere. Um, you want disaster recovery, so you can replicate your data across sites. So if a, a data center goes down or a cloud goes down, um, everything's fine. You want to be able to migrate things. Um, so if you know, you, an application starts out on premises, maybe it scales up, you move it to the local cloud, maybe you move it um, back on premises later because it's too expensive, maybe you want to move between clouds because costs, location, and all that stuff, right? Um, and then you also have a whole bunch of edge scenarios where you might have, you know, a, a huge federated set of data and you have all these edge sites that are producing data that asynchronously need to push it into the cloud or you might have sort of the opposite case where you're doing, you're bursting out to a different data center for compute and you want to sort of stage a replica or a cache of the data um, locally so you can do your analytics or whatever it is. So all these things um, that you want to do. Object storage, it turns out, is a great way to do a lot of these things because object APIs sort of lend themselves well to these sorts of multi-site, um, I, want, I want to say loosely consistent, consistent but eventually consistent um, types of applications. The API lends itself very well to this sort of thing. Um, so one of the first things that we have to um, think about also is this idea of separation of concerns. This is a term we borrowed from, from Kubernetes. Um, so the current RGW federation feature set is all about the storage administrator, the person who operates the cluster and deciding what to replicate on a, on a cluster basis or a zone basis. So it says, like, I want all the data, data in this data center to be replicated to that data center. So this is really very much about the person who manages the infrastructure. Um, but it turns out that a lot of these capabilities um, aren't really about the infrastructure, but they're about the data. Like, as a consumer, as a developer who's consuming the storage resources, I have one data set, and I want this data set to be placed here or replicated between here and there because the importance of that data and the needs um, of that data vary, um, and, the, and other data sets might not be the same, right? So having, you sort of need both um, uh, layers of concerns to be able to control these, these features. 
So the goal is for the bucket owner, for the developer persona, to be able to control the placement and migration and replication of data in RGW, provided it performs, um, conforms to some policy. So in the same way you would set a quota that says that this user can only store 100 terabytes of object data, um, you don't want that user to use that 100 terabytes on all 17 sites in your federated configuration, right? You might limit them to certain sites or certain tiers or whatever. Um, so provided you can define some policy, you want to give control to the data owner to control where that data goes. Um, there's sort of a second part of this, um, which is called Project Zipper, um, which is essentially creating an internal abstraction layer inside RGW, sort of like a VFS for buckets. So current buckets um, in RGW are always backed by Rados, um, but we'd like to have buckets that are backed by, um, that are essentially pass-throughs to external storage services. Um, so maybe bucket foo doesn't actually store any data in that cluster, but it's actually just stored in bucket bar and S3. And we're just using RGW as sort of a uniform access layer and as an API translation layer. Maybe it's an Azure blob bucket, for example, but I want to code everything to S3, and so it's all going through RGW. And then um, we'll be adding the ability to having sort of not only these, um, these different backend implementations for buckets, be able to layer them and combine them in interesting ways to support things like migration, which I'll talk about here. Um, so the way that RGW works, um, you can sort of view it as an onion as, as terms of the, the way it describes um, how, how the data should be stored in the system. So at the, at the topmost level, which isn't really shown here, there's just sort of the map that says these are the zones I have and these are the endpoints and these are which zones are replicating to which other zones. Uh, but given a particular zone, you have a couple different layers of metadata. The first layer is that namespace, what users in um, buckets exist and how the buckets behave, um, where the bucket, what zones are in and so on. One layer down, you have the indexes that in, um, enumerate all the objects within, within a particular bucket. And then the last layer, you actually have the actual data. This is sort of what, what RGW does today, if you sort of stratify it into the, the steps that you take in order to actually access a byte of data. Um, so in the, the most common use case, you're just doing that, right? You have an RGW, you have these three bucket pools, you're just doing the same things you would always do. But notably, it's the, there's the metadata that, about the bucket that says this is a regular bucket, this is the radius pool that the data is stored in, this is where the index goes. So um, we've added a lifecycle API that allows you to do some tiering automatically in this so this continues to evolve, but this is sort of the, the basic view. Um, but you can imagine doing uh, more interesting things. So say you want to just do protocol translation. Say you want to deploy your application in the Azure cloud, um, and you're using RGW just as a protocol translation, so you don't have to change your application. It's still talking S3. Um, and in this case, you would have um, the metadata about your bucket would say that instead of this being sort of a traditional Redis bucket, this is a pass-through to this Azure blob, whatever they call it, with this credential or whatever, and S3 is basically just, pro or not S3, but RGW is just proxying through all the storage um, to that backend. And this can, you can imagine this working in two ways. Um, sort of an in-band mode would be that um, there's one credential to talk to the public cloud and RGW is storing everything sort of as that credential, and you do all your access through RGW. Um, and you can do things in that case like encrypting all the data. So actually all the data that hits the public cloud might be obscured and you have to access it through RGW. Um, but you can also imagine an out-of-band mode um, as well. So maybe um, uh, the, it's doing a credential translation so that when you store something through RGW, it'll put it in the external cloud bucket, but you can also use a different credential to access that directly. And this might be useful if you're, um, you know, maybe you want to mirror all your data between an RGW bucket and also an S3 bucket and use like uh, the AWS features like um, CloudFront or whatever to, to consume that. Um, so you want to be able to enable both modes. Um, you can imagine um, you know, having that, that mirroring capability, um, also doing things like bucket migration. So maybe a bucket starts at an RGW and you want to move it to an external cloud. And so you could define um, the bucket to, to initially um, direct all reads first to the RGW bucket, and if you miss, go to the external bucket. The writes sort of go to both. You have a background process that's moving one across. Depending on how you sort of order um, where the reads, reads are attempted and where the writes go, you can orchestrate a migration of data out of RGW into an external bucket or the other way around where you have an existing external bucket. You shift all your clients to access it through RGW and asynchronously migrate the data back the other direction. Um, you can imagine a caching scenario where you have um, like an existing data set that's in RGW um, or in an external bucket. 
um, and you want to, um, in another site, have a local cache that's stored in a different place and sort of on-demand cache copy the data, and if you don't see it there, then you go to the external store to go find it. Um, and again, it's uh, sort of a trick of determining where the reads are attempted, when, which order you try them in, um, and where the writes go. And depending on how you order that, you can, you can do that sort of thing. Um, and you can also imagine um, sort of pushing this one layer, layer down to do tiering. So you have sort of, say you start with a traditional RGW bucket um, where all the objects are stored in the local cluster, but you have individual objects that are cold or not being used and you want to store those in an external store and then update the bucket metadata to just point to something external. Um, all of these scenarios um, cover different sets of use cases and we sort of want to support all of them. And so these sort of, um, a couple of key efforts are going on in our GW right to enable all these different use cases. Um, so the first is making that sort of bucket layer, um, that zipper VFS for buckets, um, making that work um, so that you can have these different backends for local storage, um, pass through, and so on. Um, and then the other part is um, improving and refactoring the way that the, the metadata about users and buckets is represented and so that we can sort of describe these different scenarios and configurations um, in a flexible way to say that this bucket should behave like this and this other bucket should behave like that. Um, the first um, part of this is the, um, that we're working on for Octopus is around um, making the multi-site, the existing multi-site capabilities um, configurable on a per bucket basis. So right now you say have to say this entire zone is replicated to that zone. Um, so the first part is breaking that, that linkage so they can say this bucket should be replicated in this way and this other bucket should be replicated in this other way. Um, so that's the first, first stage. Um, we expect, hope that's gonna be in Octopus. In the meantime, this zipper effort to create the VFS is happening on the back end. Um, and once that's sort of in place, um, then we'll find out what, what other scenarios are gonna be able to be supported when and in what order. So um, that's sort of a, a whirlwind tour of what we have, what our sort of vision for RGW is. Um, feel free to ask me any questions about that um, later or today. And that's, that's everything I have. Um, Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions on Octopus or on anything else, or we might be out of time. <laughs> anyway. Take okay, so uh, we're uh, still running behind on schedule, but <laughs> all good content. Uh, Dan, how do you feel about uh, still kicking coffee off break. that coffee break? Yeah. Coffee break until 11, yeah. Yeah, so can we say like uh, 10 minutes then? I don't, yeah, uh, or 11 is okay, I think. Okay. It's, we're okay. Okay, so we'll say at 11 we'll come back and we'll hear from Dr. <laughs> Matthew Vernon on Ceph uh, supporting genetics.